Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. Hi, Dave. Hi, this is This and That. We are going to be discussing everything going on in the figure skating world, news from around the world, Japan, Russia. We're going to touch on the Channel One Cup and, uh, you know, keep it all in perspective here. We're doing this early on Thursday night. Um, I haven't decided if I'm releasing this tonight or Sunday. I was thinking, you know, so much happens. It could be out of date by the time Sunday happens. And I don't remember... There was that period in the spring last year where every time we would finish a show, then all of a sudden our phones would explode with all of the news. Yeah. <laughs> so you are going uh, to the Hamptons uh, this weekend on vacay. We don't know what you know, you're set up. So we thought to get it done. And, you know, I'm competing. I leave on Monday. Uh, so how exciting. Are you looking I'm forward ex- to it? Yes, I'm excited. So, yeah. Good. Um, usually I'm like more nervous right now, but I feel pretty good. I feel pretty like. I love that. And where are they being held this year? We're uh, at Udell, the home of like Pat Lipinski and Terra Mania and Christine Brennan's Inside Edge. <laughs> That's where it all went down, honey. Yes. Yeah. So, I've never there seen may be some before. mania of its own happening this week. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So it's been like, I, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> it's a long yeah. time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. Good. Amazing. Like, you know, I put updates on my personal Instagram. You can check it out. I loved them. It's been fun to watch your progress. Ooh. Like, I find it very, I find it very interesting. Yeah. I'm feeling better. So it's like I chose every decision that I made in the program. Like, I made it. So <laughs> ownership. Oh, I love that. Not like, yeah. It's on me, baby, and I'm okay with that. So, so yeah. here's a random question. So then do you dry clean your outfit in between or do you just kind of air it out? I only wore it once, so yeah. I aired it out. Okay, fine. Like my I, costume last year, the way it's like the jersey like material, I feel like it had like deodorant on it and I would try to like, I'm so fearful of taking it to dry cleaning. And then like- That's what I would think. Come off. Yeah. I try to avoid taking it cleaned. And I know that people right. have different opinions on that. But the but, minute you start cleaning anything, even like fine silks and suede and stuff, they, they just are never the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I've always wondered that about skaters because obviously there's- I sweating. try to like spot clean it, you know, like okay. with a little water and, you know. You're tide penning all over the place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do. You know, I mean, a lot of people don't like to get theirs that cleaned out the season for those reasons, because they do not. You know. Yeah. I, mean, I wondered that at nationals, as we were walking past all those famous nationals outfits, like they had the yeah, Randy and Ty, like rainbow ones and all that. I'm like, I wonder how clean that is. <laughs> Definitely not one that I would trust in a dry cleaner bag that you just throw in the wash. Like, Correct. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, they, uh, there were dry cleaners that where I grew up where they always used to advertise like, we clean for the New York City Ballet. And I thought, why are they driving to Jersey to get it clean? Like, there's no dry cleaners in Manhattan. Like, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But it's probably twice as much money. That's the thing. <laughs> AB, okay. I don't know. But so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Russian cup. Uh, and then we'll go on. Just a just smidge. That. Yeah, just a smidge. I think people, some were going to be upset. Some people said, cover it up. You know, People love to just like split down the middle. Um, but I think it, some people were so mad. One guy, Marcus Howard, who's watched this for years, he's like, I'm unsubscribing. You talk about Russia for nine minutes. I'm like, okay, you'll be back. I saw uh, that. I was, yeah. I'm like, mm, it was a two and a half hour show. It was a two and a half yeah, hour per, show. The maybe. percentage was correct. The percentage was yes. correct. Yeah. So um, you, I caught up today on this. You, mm responded to me that you had like a visceral response watching it and I wonder so I wasn't really tracking what happened like usually I read sports route every day and there was a time just being so tired of the last couple of weeks with everything going on in my life for like I wasn't reading it as much and I, I think now that they're out of skating you can recognize some of the silliness for what it is now that they're not really relevant, right? So right. Now that the Russians are not particularly relevant. The propaganda feels different because they're not actually competing. Like I think when they were going to the Olympics and they were putting out all of their stuff, like it had a different um, weight to it, right? Yes. Or effectiveness or a different saliency. But 
to Good watch word. them and watch what's happening internationally. And then Tarasova making quotes like, well, of course they're gonna try to ban Russia because we're the strongest. And you think this actually has nothing to do with sports, even though Russia probably should have gotten a, a lifetime achievement award after the Sochi games, mm. which I guess we're all pretending didn't happen. <laughs> I, right. I don't know. Right. Uh, and everything uh, that we have learned since then, they have only reinforced. At this point, I have to say, for whatever the reason, and people at Worlds, some coaches messaged me and after, and they said that it felt like it was rid of a toxic energy. And I know that you said that you felt like this event had that energy for you. Yes, I mean, and that's the thing. It reminded me not, not to dumb down this situation, but it reminds me of when you have a toxic friend in a friend group or something, and then suddenly that person is no longer a part of that friend group. And suddenly you just feel the weight lifted from the general energy of the room. And, and all the joy that was felt at the world championships, all of the freedom, all of the art, all of the pleasantries, it was just such a stark contrast to go then and watch these clips where the mood felt a little bit poisoned. It felt um, edgy and aggressive and icky and not, not the characteristics that often draw me to a sport in the same way, like if you're, I love playing games, board games, video games sometimes randomly, but you don't like playing with someone who even if they win or lose, the response is a little bit too aggressive. Um, and, and that's what this reminded me of, like in the, in the boxes for the teams and the aggression of all the stuff, it, it was more to marvel at someone's grit and mm. determination than it was one of joy and beauty and expression and talent. I well, felt. that is what really has happened with their ladies skaters, women skaters over the last years is that we watch these skaters grit out quadruple jumps in spite of technique, in spite of everything going on around them. And there's a very heavy vibe um, right. where they don't seem to just be performing for the joy of it. And some people do perform better perhaps with that negative motivation, but I don't think it works for most people. Uh, but you do see, obviously, if you have 20 girls to choose from and three respond well to negative uh, reinforcement and that gets them to the front of the line, well, it, and it's, it's tough because I think a lot of people have fallen in love with the idea. Uh, someone said, you know, we fell in love with the wave. You know, the, mm. we fell in love with this idea that the women's skater could be as thin as possible, as gaunt as possible, and just somehow be doing quadruple jumps. When you're like, wait a second, how come everyone else in the world who does these elements like are muscular, right? <laughs> has, yeah, up? has to embody a completely different type. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, sorry. I'm just- it's, it's, I, different and, and, and I even thought, you know, Japanese skaters who tried to emulate that technique have also had severe eating disorders, also trained with coaches who are in lawsuits about being abusive. You just, you see it and I don't think that it's positive. Um, well, and I think in the United States with Larry Nasser, all these sorts of things that are coming out, there, there's a big um, culture right now of calling out abuse because I feel like in North America, the the mood is shifting about, yeah, okay, all of that garbage, all of that trauma, for what? Mm -hmm. For a medal? For a competition? How, how inane? I find that that's shifting from maybe a mindset that, that came earlier where it was go for it, go for the gold, try your hardest, give it your all. And I think we're wondering what, what is the point of that? And is it worth the sacrifice that, that has to be made? And clearly they're not of that mindset at the moment. They're yeah, still in the do whatever it takes. It was interesting to just see the skaters. Um, Volieva already looked taller. Mm -hmm. now, this is interesting because you'll often see this happens in several sports. In a sport where someone is overtrained and undernourished, when the second the body has a moment of breath, 
it changes like the growth spurt happens and like sometimes you'll even see it when like a skater will go to japan for shows in the past like uh you always see it like in gymnastics like if you want to know like if something is a little wrong you'd watch the gymnasts go on the post olympic tour and be like whoa what happened in a week like and you'll see these things happen and it was just interesting to me that already and they all watered down right um however it was interesting to me that the elements that Valieva took out, the triple axel, which did not have the most sound technique without the left arm, and then the sal, which was right. not always the best. It was interesting to me that those were the jumps that went first because we've always seen with the team to breeds the skaters that they are on this timeline when the jumps failed. And we did see with Sherbakova that her jumps had kind of failed. We know that she has this like iron will of sorts that she was on liquid food at the Olympics. To try attempting quad flips and things. I, again, I just don't know how those two things go together. So, but it, it was interesting to see that, like, I'll be very curious to note, like, what they're capable of doing in six months to a year. Mm. Where is the basic skating ability? Because when you watch Medvedeva and Zagitova, the basic skating ability is not there. Like right. one, the body is so damaged and the skating skills weren't there to begin with. So it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens. It seems like Sherbakova is hinting that she's going to retire. We don't know what will happen for Valieva. She's obviously a huge symbol of propaganda. Abe, I'm so sorry. This is the person that just arrived and I thought that could... Okay, so we were just talking about Sherbakova maybe retiring. Jonathan sold a mirror on Marketplace. <laughs> Good for Jonathan. Yes. Yeah. Because yes. you know what? This is this could be one of those things where you thought something scandalous was said and then we had to go back, but instead I just sold a mirror. Okay, sorry. <laughs> really stopped things for saying scandalous things very often. So maybe once or yeah, twice said something that we shouldn't have said publicly, but yeah. Yeah. Usually uh, it's just that I've overhydrated and need to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> long shows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of which, I was running a town hall for work oh. the other day, but doing it over Zoom. And of course, like I woke up and caffeinated and hydrated and thought I went to the bathroom enough times and like started running the slideshow. And I was like, oh my God, we're like five minutes in. And I feel like I got to take a bio break. Take a moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Amazing. So I was like <laughs> finding the minutes when I could do it. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we screen so, share with someone else right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm on mute so I could run to the bathroom and then not, yeah. All, all of the things, you know how Tricky. it is. Because I was teaching at a summer program where like one of the final performances like culminated in an online Zoom recital and Dave, someone peed. You could hear someone peeing in the audience that had not muted themselves while the soprano was singing Xerxes. It was horrifying. Yeah. So there you go. We had some fun moments on Zoom. We had a TSL Live where someone was like, had their camera on and they were like brushing their teeth before bed. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> well, when we did the Olympic one, someone was about to share medical information with their husband that had come into the room. And remember, Jenny was like so panicked. She's got the HIPAA stuff like built in there. So she was like, shush, shush, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> It well, the crazy. other day I was talking about Pilates and someone's like, what is he talking about? And I was like, Pilates, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Try it. It will bring you inner peace. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or good abs. I mean, which also has its own form of peace. They're, They're not strong, mutually exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> strong core is a strong skater. Okay. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, anyway, I thought it was. We were talking about Anna pot potentially retiring. Uh, of course she is. I mean, yeah, yeah. How would she? She has willed herself beyond what could yeah. be expected of a human. Okay, I don't know. Look, I am not a doctor, Shavetsky. I don't know Thank what uh, yeah. <laughs> has allowed this to all transpire. Um, however, there seems to be a strong inner will and a feeling like the world is about to collapse and then she pulls through at the last moment. But it doesn't seem to be like a joyous up and down. It's, it seemed like she's had a tough year that has ended well, started really rough and right. scary. So, um, yeah, I, 
I don't know, interesting not to see Trusova here uh, doing shows with Plushenka. It seems that she is leaving that rank. Uh, I remember when people first said after the Olympics, there were comments like, don't say that, it's not official. You're thinking like, what we witnessed at the Olympics was... Um, How do you go back to that? How does that just go back to normal? Yeah. That to me is ending. Like, yeah. Considering that the Russian economy is failing and somehow the government is still putting on this event for propaganda, although it wasn't shown live and sports Rude would note that it wasn't show, shown live, which was rare for them. Mm. Um, and interesting that it's blocked on the internet, but a lot of the Russians and Ukrainians that I know in skating watch the event because they all have the Russian cable package, which I believe they buy through Canada. Someone was explaining to me that there's a company that they, you, that's how they get all of the cable channels for like Ukrainian news and Russian news and channel one. So for first channel, so you could have first channel through your cable, but not through your internet. I mean, these are some of like the weird hmm. loopholes and, and things that I think we're all figuring out where the Russians weren't going to be on Instagram and then some are on VPN and it's... Oh. Well, th this was my question because as we sort of thought that Instagram was not happening in Russia, is it just that the Russians can't see what some of these pages are posting? Because for instance, like Angel is of Plushenko and all this sort of stuff, they have continued to post. I didn't know if they're posting because of a VPN, if someone outside of the country is posting for them, but mainly it seems to me that whatever they post, what it really means is that Russians in Russia are not consuming that, that social As much, media. although so many of Plushenka's personal posts have been so pro-war. Yeah. So, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't understand how that ban does or does not work. I guess. I've been fascinated though, about how it Terry has chosen to distance herself from Putin because I have gotten confirmation that the team two Burita skaters were obviously invited to the pro-Putin rally that took place mm. for the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea, which where they, you know, were stomping on the Ukrainian flag uh, and cheering. That event, you did not see Sherbakova there. You did not see Valieva there. You did not right. see Trusova there. You didn't see Tuberidza there. You did see- Or even Med Medvedeva, Zagitova, like even the, even the former. It was yeah. allegedly invited from, a source that I heard from. So they have all had to work a dance and some of them are more knowledgeable of the Western point of view than others. Um, Cause Sotnikova was there. I had not realized Sotnikova was also there. Well, her career is very much tied in being pro-Russia. Plushenka has right. been pro-Russia, Svetlana Horkina in the Duma. I mean, these are people that really have made that choice, right? But it's interesting because who has benefited from the Russian system and government and been a part of the propaganda more than a Terry? I mean, she has become a symbol. Right. Uh, if, you are, if you don't like her, you are afraid of Russia, you this, that, and the other, right? She was not there. And she's the right. lead of her post. And her daughter in was in Las Vegas as everything right. was going on and posting about being in Las Vegas, which I thought was a little bit tone deaf being that you're from a country and just represented at the Olympics and there's a war going on. Right. It felt weird. Like yeah. I would, if I were Diana Davis and I knew that people didn't think I even deserved to go to the Olympics, I'd be like keeping a very low profile for- Yeah, wow. less is more at the moment, yeah. So I, I thought that that was strange, but you know, she's free to, she's, listen, I think she's got dual citizenship perhaps, uh, you know, I don't know her passports, but she was certainly born here and, um, you know, anchor baby, I guess. Uh, I, I think that's a term, it's a thing. No, no, I know it's a term, I know. Listen, listen Ilanique had her child in the US for a reason, yeah. okay? Yeah. Keep paying attention to all these people that get so pro-Russia, but the act, watch the actions rather than mm. what they do. So I think there, you know, I, what a Terry does next, who knows? I mean, I think that the government would sponsor her uh, for, to make sure that she could have skaters, other coaches, I don't know. They well, and this is, this is even as we talk about 
potential retirements. And people get really upset when we say that, like we're retiring skaters. No, it's just people we could potentially foresee calling it a day. But oh, um, if you're Jason I, Brown, you barely made the Olympic team. You skated well. And then had you had a nice out. moment at the Olympics. Yeah. And you're on vacation, have already grown out your hair, no longer have your competition haircut, and are working on show programs with Roheen while the world championships are going on. I'm thinking you retired. You've already been through three Olympic cycles. Well, and then gave that confusing, I thought what I was reading at first was that a retirement posting on Instagram. Remember, but Michelle, it ended Kwan, up being... is, Michelle Kwan never officially retired, Jonathan. She is taking She's still it in it. <laughs> She's taking it year by year. Uh, Sasha and, and those NBC Olympic articles that would always, you know, in retrospect, talk about a Zagitova still potentially coming back or something. And you're like, what? what? Every season, right? Yeah, right. Many, yes, Zagitova just on a break. The right. break has been a long time coming. Um, right. Right. How about Johnny Weir was taking off to work on his technique. It's what he originally mm. told us in 2010. That's right. He's still working on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, if you're if you're Russian and you're on, it is returning to Yale, and my question is, he bringing his skates? Uh, right. Right. right, yeah. But I mean, if you're if you're one of these Russian athletes, and I'm I'm very curious if what happens on this Grand Prix now did I, was this a rumor or did I read somewhere that they were looking into the possibility of hosting um, Grand Prix in different locations for next season? Well, I think that is what people are surmising. Um, okay, that's speculation, okay. What I'm hearing is, uh, I think the reality of the longer that the war goes on, the more that people are beginning to make plans of what to do without Russia. I mean, you just have to think uh, this, but this goes so much broader than sports, right? So this goes on in other, political avenues in terms of just lifting sanctions. We saw Arena Rodnina being sanctioned. So you see all of this, and I'll do an As the Blade Turns this weekend, uh, but we are moving, you know, the sanctions are starting to become greater, obviously over time, the longer this goes, everyone's just, and I know, I know Putin was having his own response about petroleum exports today in the news and we'll have to see, but it's getting nastier, right? It's not getting easier. And, there were, unless the CIS would cave so much to allow Russians to compete on some sort of neutral status, it seems hardly, like, it seems really unlikely that they will be back um, next season. And someone had a really good point. I was speaking to a coach today, and they said about next season, and just talking about the world championships and how many spots Russia should get. They said, look, the Spanish pairs or the Italian pairs they were talking about, you know, had COVID. And right. they didn't both have both of the Italian pair teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. The Italian pairs had COVID. They didn't have the opportunity to get two spots. The ISU says tough shit. Yeah. Like, so you can have one entry. Yeah. They don't, even though we all know that they only had the opportunity because of COVID. Right. They aren't given any allowances. Right. So if you are China who decided not to show up or Russia, who was kicked out, or Belarus, I would have a big issue if they were. Yes, I think it 100% stands to reason that they would have one entry per discipline. And I would only, not because I don't want to see Russian skaters, but I think that there's been so much in skating where it feels like what's true for one country isn't true for another, mm. right? Why was Bobrova allowed to compete after she tested positive for meldonium? Uh, only really set out the worlds and was back next season. Yet Carolina Costner, right, uh, helped her boyfriend eighteen months or something like that. That she was you know, yeah seasons that she lost out on. How is that fair? Right. Or even I just we and we've already discussed it in a previous video, but the uh, the huge. Uh, public shaming of Yalem Kim for a miscommunication about a test that she did take and was negative for um, back at a junior worlds or whatever that was. It, it just, just, it doesn't seem evenly applied. That's- was it true. Zelizhnyakov gave an interview, Master of the Boogie Woogie, and he was talking about how Valieva, 
you know, the different reasons he could come up with for how she could have taken um, the pill. None of them had to deal with being given by her coaches or her taking it herself, right? Like it was all like these different things, but even the Russians don't fully buy the excuse right. presented to the court of arbitration for sport. They're not 100% behind it. If they were 100% behind it, they'd be like, her grandfather, her grandfather, her grandfather. Right, right. You're seeing it differently. Right. Um, also, and again, just from the skating itself, again, going back to all of those programs, all of that approach to ladies skating, after what we saw with the women in, in Montpellier was so incredible. It was just such a stark contrast to, to see all of that again. And I-, well, I really you know that Terry that. was, they, they, Push this on Sports Rue that she hugged Valjeva after the short program. They uh, they wanted to put that front and center. Yeah. And after the scandal yeah. at the Olympics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very performative. Uh, um, it's not uncommon to hug your coach after a skate, but it, the, the highlighting of it had to do right with it. exactly it was very compensatory. But also, even having just seen the White Crow, as we, as we talked about in the last show, which I just loved and can't recommend enough. Um, it was just this idea, even when the Nureyev was in Paris, they were like, well, why are the, why is this Soviet dance company here? And they were, they kept saying, it is our job to demonstrate to the world that we are better at this. That is the goal of why we are here. And I wonder what Russian public sentiment is if they're only domestic competitions, if they have exclusively Russia with Russia skating, does it still give them whatever it is they love to feel when they see Russia, quote unquote, dominate on the international scene? It's I don't know. It's certainly too during COVID. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't think it, I, I think when the propaganda is that strong, <laughs> they can build that up. See the best skaters I, in the world. We're so strong, they won't let us compete. That's what- But if saying. they if they had their real world championships with the Channel One Cup, I, it would stand to reason to me if they are taken out of the Grand Prix assignments for next season, that they will create their own version of it. Of course. Yeah. 100%. Of yeah. course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think if you know you don't have international competition waiting for you next season and you don't know how much longer you're going to be able to hold on, then I think if you're a Shervakova, if you're a Tarasova Morozov, if you're Vicky and Nikki, yeah, Tuk Dimisheva, I think you might, this might be the time. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, be, I think even Trusova, you have to wonder. I mean, she's pretty driven right now, but given what she just went through and the fact that she wasn't ready to compete yet, I could see an athlete like that taking a bit of a pause before they really got back into just the level of motivation that it takes to be able to train a program with five quads right. on whatever pharmaceuticals you are on. Still, to be able to go and train to do that takes strong motivation. Yeah. don't have the international competitions and you've been exposed to international competitions. And now that you've been to the Olympics, so you know that you're not just like chasing the dream anymore before it happened, I think it would be pretty difficult to get yeah. back. To stay motivated, yeah. You'd have to really find a love and really find your own why more than just fear monetary right. gain, other, right. it would be very difficult to perform at that high of a level. So I don't know. Um, the other thing is, I mean, when when is, um, who decides now about Valieva? Now it's up to WADA and Rusada? Rusada, WADA, CAS. I mean, this will all play uh, still. Yeah. And by August, did you mention in one of your- August, yeah. Is August, when we're so fine from Rusada, right? Which you know okay. that, that she did nothing. So, although my, what I'm wondering is if let's say the ISU makes a bold move and says no Russia for next season, mm -hmm. is this Rusada's opportunity to do a faux sort of judgment and say you're out a season? 
And it's the season that doesn't matter anyway, because they may not be eligible for international competition regardless. It could be. Anything that comes out at this point, I think is going to be met with so much skepticism and right. investigation. Right. I think it depends how big of a priority it is to WADA. I mean, it's fallen off because the war has overshadowed this, but this was still right. a pretty big deal in international sports before the rest of the distraction happened. So we'll have to see kind of what happens there. I don't see it for see like a big international career for volume moving forward, but right. beyond one season where they tried to have like a Zagit of a world title, but I, I don't know that what is possible, right? After, we'll yeah. Um, yeah. And again, there's a lot of people that, that come back with, well, what about other countries that have partaken in wars, just or unjust, you know? And, and the idea here is, again, to reiterate the melding of sport with politics in Russia that is so different than anywhere else. So yes, you're right. Um, the US had some very problematic moments in Afghanistan, but it didn't involve their figure skaters hand in hand with the government at that time, like it seems to here. It's just so intertwined that I think it does become difficult. They keep saying it's separate, but all their actions show otherwise. I mean, I'm sure I you saw the gymnast who wore the Z at the competition. There were also fans at the world championships who brought a Russian flag for Maurizi, who then the flag was taken away from during practice. Right. Uh, Right. So these are all really complicated issues. Yeah. But the longer this goes on in Ukraine with no end in sight, I, uh, imagine that it ended tomorrow. Do mm. you think everyone's just going to go back to right the way I did? It's hard to imagine, right? That ever, oh, right. it's done. Even even certain things outside of skating that that happened during COVID, for instance, it was there is no just going back to before. Everything everything is changed forever, and, yeah. and I think this is no exception to that. You don't just erase it and go back. It it something has to change. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I think that they were maybe banned not for all of the reasons that they should have been banned for. Right. Um, and there are issues with that and right. have issues in sports. So yeah, well, I, I, I do have to say it was interesting to see Tarasova and Morozov performed one of their better programs of the season. They did have a problem on a throw. And Kolyada had one of the most gorgeous programs he's ever had. He did pop the axle. Like I think he popped right. a double axle in the second half, but his jump landings were better than ever. It was maybe relaxed, no pressure, end of a season, not a world championship. So this doesn't really count for much, but he was able to just. And he was well. a fascinating person to watch here because he also wasn't a part of the gang. Mm. He was always sitting off by himself. He was very stoic. And, you know, even when they're trying to do their silly cockamamie interviews, they were like met with almost silence and occasional one word responses. He, he was not part of the this like clicky game they were playing. He's one of the most fascinating skaters because we don't actually know a lot about what has happened, but it, it's very clear that there's some sort of a backstory there. The season that he was out with the sinus issues. I was just gonna say it's beyond sinuses, whatever this is, yeah. What was the relationship like with the old coach? What was the environment like? When you have this level of talent and technique, but then the skater doesn't do well, you start to wonder, and I'm not blaming him, shaming him in any way, but you, you start to look like, is it a training issue? Is it a psychological issue based on perhaps emotionally abusive training methods? What is the reason? And we don't know. Where's the disconnect? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When the technique is that good, when the skating right. is that pure, what is the reason? Right. It doesn't seem like this is the most introspective country. So mm -hmm. we don't fully know what is yeah. happening there. So I, I mean, and all you'd have to do is read that article we read about Svetlana Horkina responding mm -hmm. to a uh, gymnast talking about abuse. One, she was like, get over it. You're lucky to get that abuse in training because it makes you better. And two, why do we even care what they said? They haven't even won a gold medal. And I was like, oh my gosh. The, it, it was just so upsetting to read for a multitude of reasons.
Well, I had a coach say to me, why do you say that two breeds is too mean to the skaters? She gets results. It's a different mindset. And that, and that's what I'm saying. And that's the thing that's culturally shifting here is we're curious if any result is really worth that. Yeah. I'm, I think we're starting to think a little bit differently about that as we expose more things. Yeah. So it, yeah. all fascinating, but um, right. you know, not to be solved just in this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <isn't> it? <laughs> Interesting to see that both Satoko and uh, Mai Mihara retired, which it does feel like a big loss uh, to skating. It really does. And, and I'm glad that Mai came up again because even though the show was two and a half hours, I wanted to bring her up and forgot to uh, during the world recap because it was tough for me. Mm -hmm. It was tough for me not to see her at the Olympics or Worlds. And I am, I'm a big supporter of pushing the future, which mm -hmm. clearly um, the Japanese Federation feels they have in Mana Kawabe. But, uh, you yeah. know, in the same yeah. way with Ilya, the, exactly. But with Ilya and Jason, so they split those assignments. Okay, Jason, go to the Olympics. Ilya, don't worry, we're gonna send you to Worlds. I would have loved to have seen Mai at these Worlds. Um, Mai who skated beautifully. Uh, all season, and then won that four continents. Thank goodness she was able to have that moment as her last. It, yeah, perhaps why you have a selection committee sometimes. We, we get into these debates time and time again. Should the Olympic trials count for everything? I think this is one example where you could put in the column of maybe Monica Wabi wasn't the right choice. I don't, she was so good at Japanese nationals, but my Mihar was strong throughout the season. Right. You could put this, maybe the types of falls that Mana took opening up on the axle and the scary things that she did. You know, when it went wrong, it went really wrong. Right. Maybe she wasn't ready for the big pressure. Or at least for both. I understand wanting to give Mana but to a moment. But both is interesting. That's tough. I'm sure, and of course, Mai is probably sweeter than I am, but I, I was upset on her behalf at, at both of them. Well, it's tough, especially now. I mean, obviously to fail at the Olympics can be traumatizing, right? And to have to compete so soon after. You, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, but now it's like, oh, she's failed twice at two huge competitions. To overcome that for next year is quite... Um, and it was one of the things, seeing her in person in Vancouver at Skate Canada, both actually Mana and Mai, the audience warmth for Mai was inspiring. I, I didn't, you know, back in the day when she just first came out, she was sort of more generically lovely. And then she went away. And when she returned, there was a renewed joy in what she was the doing. It's very infectious. It, it yeah. was so, and to see the audience, the minute she came out, just like wrap her in a hug of support. It It's really lovely. And uh, she was always a delightful, joyous skater to watch. So that's, yeah. sorry to see her retire. Yeah. But We did see that Camden uh, will be continuing. So that is certainly and also i feel like i just glossed over uh, satoko who i think everyone knows is like my end all be all uh, when mao left us and i was so nervous about not seeing those kinds of step sequences anymore then satoko just kept blowing my mind with every program obviously she will be immensely missed also i know i i'm not surprised that satoko retired it's obviously sad right. but it feels like it's been yeah. coming for of course of course just like it's a it's an end to what was just a beautiful output of programs although i hope she does so many shows i hope so too there are some skaters like lambiel that i've enjoyed more as a professional skater than even as an amateur skater to watch what he was able to do so perhaps satako could be similar she wouldn't have to do any toe jumps anymore we wouldn't have to watch right. those nations maybe it would be better to yeah appreciate yeah. her so i haven't mm. said that we haven't seen as much of mal since she stopped competing so yeah she has done some tours but we haven't seen her as out and about as other skaters. So yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of watch and who's gonna continue for next year. But I do think that the landscape is going to change. And I was like, what does your gut say about Kane and LaDuke? Duke? Do you think that they will continue now? That's a tough call. Uh, do they feel like it's unfinished business now? And again, does part of their decision lie in understanding who is competing on that Grand Prix or not next season? 
Well, they have a huge opportunity in the United States. Hmm. And if I were the USFS, I would be begging them to continue because there are all of these pairs. And you have to think Alexa and Brandon, just when the world's, they may choose to be done. I could see it going either way for them. Yeah. I mean, they're probably never going to top those two skates that they had. Um, not to say that they couldn't do it again. Right. Um, but even if you, maybe the result wouldn't be the same. You have to start to look at if you want to have a family, your life, your, your body, all of that. I, I don't know. I mean, I would I mean, love fasc to Fascinating that they earned three spots for the United States. And I'm like, do we have three pairs to send with the breakup? Are they continuing? Are they not? I mean, I would encourage them to continue. That that next tier down of people, especially with um, the separation of, yeah. Then who are you really left with to even send? It's, it's an interesting dilemma. In Canadian pairs, uh, you have to wonder if Vanessa and Eric will continue at this point after this season, so... And I talked to Marie France and she said that Olivia and Adrian, it's undecided what they will do. They're going to take a vacation and then have a conversation and decide what to do after that. I mean, they're a team that I really think that they're just starting to hit their stride. No, now that Spain can finally send both teams to the world. <laughs> yeah. But I think in terms of performance, they're just getting there. So. Yeah. And this was a huge moment of wow look at us so they're in such a great position to make a, a move forward just like i think the british are right now as well yeah. and we'll see what happens the italians are staying in so if it's chalk and baits in the italians all next season i don't know oh i, I think, think there's there's room for a spanish or a great britain team i think that chalk and baits probably have a great chance to win i would think so too or at least when and again, lot. I know we've talked about it that Hubble and Donahue seem to be potentially missing a big opportunity here, but I'm sure they have the reasons. Yeah, but even with them, like I think it would be really hard. They mentally prepared. They said all year it was going to be their last. So they've already gone through that mental separation from the sport. Mm, right. But if Russia's out next year, Man, oh man. Do you and France. I, I mean, and, and Gabby and Guillaume. And you've been that talented for that long. If you have anything left in the tank, I think you do it. But maybe they don't. Maybe they... And that's possible. Yeah. And they perform so well. So they went out on like personal best performances at the Olympics and at the World Championship. So maybe. It was interesting watching... Um, the On Edge series from the Olympics, they really highlighted mistakes more than we could see them in the TV book. They like zoomed in when someone would like a slip. Yeah. The, big, the rhythm dance and uh, the Spanish team in the rhythm dance, it was highlighted more. But yeah, I enjoyed watching that series overall. That was. Did Montreal produce that themselves? No, it was the Olympic but... channel. That... Okay. I didn't know if that was part of their marketing team that was sort of working with them that helped How make that. How smart to yeah. do that. And brand yourselves and embrace everyone and get behind your teams because they get to know them. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting to watch the show golden over the summer about gymnastics. They followed the gymnasts and to get to watch Suni Lee now, when you watched her like training and the, with her father and everything and get to know the personalities more, it becomes so You're much that much more invested. I would think. Yeah. yeah. And she had an interesting article saying that since the Olympics, she's been feeling imposter syndrome. I think that's normal, especially yeah. when, how could you not, when you're told for years that Simone Biles could fall seven times and still win everything, basically is what NBC was right. promoting. And, and Simone was absolutely incredible, is incredible, should you, you know, compete again, but she did it. And right. she did not compete, but how could you not then feel imposter when you haven't probably seen yourself in that role and you've seen yourself as maybe wanting to make it a medal in the all around, but not thinking that gold was possible. So I could see that being, yeah. Really. I just personally enjoy this new narrative of athletes being real and yeah. sharing these vulnerabilities that I think 
that everyone can relate to in their own way. I think that's so important. And that's something we don't get, for instance, from the Russian athletes that want to refuse to sh acknowledge any weakness in anyone ever. I, I really appreciate someone talking about imposter syndrome or even this, the yips or the twisties or this, the, however we want to word it. I mean, I think anyone who partakes in a skill or craft has felt something like that. And to to see it discussed on a national stage with people that they watch and idolize and are revered, I think that's really important. So, yeah. yeah. It's a healthy conversation to have. And I think so too. She's doing very well this year, uh, competing collegiately. So I think that always, that transition helps. So out, but yeah, it, it's why you hope, you know, that if they did some sort of pro competitions in addition to just shows that it could help people feel a little bit of that competitive energy as they were transitioning to the next venture so I mean even when you go back as early as Scott Hamilton saying he stood on that podium in Sarajevo being and there was that aha moment of well what's what do I do now what's the point of everything now after it's over and I and that was then when it was much easier I think to transition all of these opportunities awaiting everyone I, I don't envy a lot of these great skaters that now enter this vast unknown yeah on how to on how to segue into the next phase so well, because not only are they fighting the difference is in the skating market they're also fighting the changes of covid and things are starting to come back i mean stars and ice is coming back but who knows you know what the right. future is, especially you know borders variants strains happening yeah i mean it's a different world and i don't know what the appetite is going to be but it's going to be very Watch. And I couldn't believe, Dave, <laughs> High End Lee still has two more competitions to <laughs> do this season. When she competed. It's like, I didn't even know there were two competitions left. It's that, it's that trophy. Is it Enya? E-G-N-A? Okay. Uh, and then she's competing at another, another trophy after that that I had not heard of, but I'm sure everyone else has. But I can't recall it right now. But again, because... I know a lot of fans are probably feeling after the worlds. Well, what now? We're dealing with our own segue. Um, but of course, we so have junior actually, worlds coming up. Junior worlds being after is actually kind of nice because we'll get I think to so too. I, I actually perhaps enjoy junior worlds being after senior worlds. It maybe seems like a nice. Well, and the. Could you imagine having to do it the weekend after the Olympics close? That would have been so much, I think, for, for everyone. I saw Lindsay, I've skated on a couple of sessions with her. So she's working very hard with, you know, uh, Junior Worlds coming up and Isabeau. So I'm sure that it will be a very exciting competition. Uh, uh, Jaya Shin or Jia Shin mm -hmm. from yeah. South Korea. So I, it's gonna be an exciting competition at Junior Worlds. and. Ilya Mullen Ilya, yeah. has the opportunity to go there and win. And perhaps how many quads is he going to attempt? And, you know, Lucas. Persaud. And Gogolev. I, I, we, we saw Gogolev at one challenger, I think, this year that was, you know, in between and in its results. So I'll be interested to see what he's been up to and how he, how he, how he fares. And then next week, we've got the Synchro Worlds adult nationals um and this and your trophy happening so lots to discuss and who knows what's happening with these cis cases in russia and then so also the fun thing is that we'll get to start talking about show skating because all the shows are going to start mm. in japan uh in russia in the u.s then come stars on ice so hopefully that there's some good things to discuss i know that mariah has been training in boston because she got stars on ice so oh nice okay. are practicing. so yeah i think that There'll be plenty to discuss uh, in the coming future. I mean, I've always enjoyed some of Shoma's exhibitions even more than- Oh yeah. Yeah, so. It's how that short program was born, remember? That was one of his finest short programs, I thought. <laughs> Jason and Roheen revamped Sinnerman, your favorite, and mm. uh, a third iteration. I mean, I, what could they change at this point? What could they improve? Yeah. I'm excited Let's to find do. out. Let's yeah. find out. All right. I mean, they, <laughs> people were watching in Chicago. They went to the rink to watch them. Yeah, interesting to be able to to do that kind of work in front of a crowd. Yeah. I knew that Jason Brown was going to go rework one of his programs and we were all going to watch it. 
I'd be there. That would be interesting. Yeah, so, yeah totally. So Sheen and Jason like jamming on the ice. Yes, I would watch that. Yes. Okay. Sign uh, me up. Yeah. <laughs> Golden Edge would look sexy, everyone. 